And well, happy Easter weekend after. It was an incredible, incredible weekend last week, and I'm so glad that you are here with us today for worship. If you have your Bible or Bible app, you can go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter one. If you're using one of the Bibles underneath the seat in front of you, you'll find Philippians one on page 1,164. Uh, you know, and if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, we say this every week because we mean it. If you don't have a Bible at your house that you can read or understand easily, take one of our Bibles home with you. Read it, begin to apply it to your life. If your marriage is struggling, read passages about marriage. Let God transform your life. As you read and apply God's word, you'll find that he does that. And hello, Parker Campus. I am so glad that you, you are there today. I'm glad to be with you right there in Alumni Hall. I'm excited about what God is doing. You guys had a phenomenal weekend last weekend, uh, like 180 people in worship. That's awesome. We are excited for you. And I know that Pastor Ruben and Jared are looking forward to being back with you next weekend. Here at our Sweetwater campus, we had an incredible Easter weekend as well. Uh, over uh, over uh, 2,500 people joined us for in-person worship, which is massive in spite of COVID. If uh, many of the people joined us online, we had over 4,000 people joining us for in-person worship or online. We had baptisms all weekend. Parker Campus, I think, had four or five baptisms. It was an incredible Easter weekend. And if you're one of those people that came to our 3.30 service on Saturday afternoon to make space for everybody else, thank you. You did what we asked you to do and every person that wanted a seat had a seat and we're grateful that you were able to be flexible. And I'm excited over the next 18 weeks, we're gonna be looking at Paul's letter to the Philippian church. Uh, so over the next 18 weeks, we're kicking off a sermon series uh, on the letter of Philippians. Now, I don't know if you know this, but before he became a follower of Jesus, uh, the apostle Paul was a Jewish terrorist. He was one of the leading Pharisees that persecuted followers of Jesus. But then Paul surrendered his life to Jesus and everything changed in his world. Instead of being the persecutor, Paul became the persecuted. Instead of chasing followers of Jesus out of the cities, he was chased out of the cities. He was threatened, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was left for dead. He often went without food, uh, he was often in prison, he was constantly on the move telling people about Jesus and leading other people to a life-changing relationship. And as Paul traveled and as he preached and as he shared the good news and people became followers of Christ, churches began to pop up. These people that just gave their lives to Jesus be became a church. And then Paul stuck around for a little, little while. He, uh, he enlisted and recruited leaders inside the church. He tried to figure out what their gifting was. He raised up leaders. He would help them grow in their faith. And then Paul would move on to another city and tell people about Jesus. Many of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament are letters to churches that he started. Okay, so as we look at this letter to the Philippians, Paul began that church, he planted that church by telling people about Jesus, and then he was run off. He was chased out by the Jewish leaders. When Paul wrote Philippians, he was actually under house arrest in the city of Rome. Now, for some people, because of COVID, you might feel like you've been under house arrest for the last year, right? Uh, you've stayed inside your house, uh, you've, you've worn a mask when you've gone out, but in Paul's case, this house arrest was a little bit different. He was under house arrest, but he was actually chained to the walls inside the house. Now, friends and family or people that he didn't know, Jewish leaders could come in and they would hear him teach the good news of Jesus. He would explain the scriptures. He would talk about the Old Testament, how the Old Testament pointed people to Jesus. People were able to come and go, but Paul wasn't. He was chained up in a house for about two years. And that's where he wrote this letter. And he began writing this letter very simple. Let's read it. It's his traditional greeting that he leads in almost every one of the letters he wrote. 
Philippians 1, verse 1 through 5. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making, uh, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now you're like, pastor, good luck with this sermon, right? It's a simple greeting. Hey, here I am. This is Paul. He's identifying who he is as he begins to write this letter and he's telling us who he's writing it to. Now, anytime I receive an email, a text message, uh, one of the very first things that I do is check to see if I know who the sender is, who I'm getting it from. And if it's, a not, if it's an anonymous letter, if it's a letter that's dropped off for me and it's anonymous, I don't read it. I throw it in the trash can. And my attitude behind that is this, if a person doesn't think it's important enough to sign their name to a letter they wrote, I shouldn't think it's important enough to read. Are you with me? Plus we know the air conditioner was too cold the weekend before. But I am guilty of writing, I have been guilty of writing anonymous letters in the past, especially when I was in middle school to pretty girls, right? Like, uh, I understand that Joe likes you. What do you think about him, Anonymous? You know, I also did that in high school. Raise your hand if you ever wrote an anonymous letter. If you've ever written an anonymous letter and said, okay, we're asking for handwriting samples from you individuals, just in case we need them for the future. Now, Paul never wrote an anonymous letter. From the start of this letter, he said, I'm writing it, this is who I am, and I'm sending it to you. And it's from his greeting that we see that a follower of Jesus is a slave and a saint. A follower of Jesus is a slave and a saint. Your identity always matters, doesn't it? Your identity always matters. The other day, I was pulled over by the Lake Havasu Police Department. And the very first thing that the officer asked me for is my driver's license. It was the first thing that he asked for. It's the first thing that he wanted. What do you think I gave to him? My driver's license. I handed him exactly what he asked for. And the identification that I handed to him told him exactly what he needed to know. And then I begged him to let me go. In verse one of Paul's letter, the word that Paul used for servant in the original language is doulos. Its, it's definition is slave. When Paul used that word, he was saying, I am a slave of Christ Jesus. He, and think about this. Now he's locked up. He's in chains, he's bound, he doesn't have freedom, he can't leave the house. And then he writes to the Philippians and says, I am a slave of Jesus. But he also called the followers of Jesus that he was writing saints. He called them saints. In the original language, that word that Paul used was hagios and it means morally blameless and pure. He was saying to the Philippians, you are morally blameless, you are pure. And these two words side by side sum up how a follower of Jesus should describe themselves. We are slaves, if you're a follower of Jesus. We are slaves of Christ and we are saints. The rest of the sermon, we're gonna be talking about the weight of each one of those words, the weight that each word has behind it. First, a slave is bought, belongs, and biddable. You like that alliteration? A slave is bought, belongs, and is biddable. In early America, and even before America became a nation, slavery was a horrible evil. 
Men and women in Africa were pulled out of their, their villages and their homes living peacefully there. And by force, they were taken from their families. They were sold in the United States and the colonies. They were bought by a master. They were often beaten. They were treated harshly. And the masters thought that they had about as much value as cattle. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have been bought. A transaction has been made. A price has been paid for you. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, for God bought you at a high price. Therefore, honor God with your body. It, it's a clear teaching that throughout the New Testament, Jesus bought followers of Jesus with his blood. There is no higher, greater currency than the blood of Jesus. Nothing is as valuable as the blood of Jesus. Not gold, not silver, not Bitcoin, not the dollar. There is nothing as valuable, as precious as the blood of Jesus. And it was the blood of Jesus that actually bought followers of Christ. It's the blood of Jesus. So that means you belong to him. He has bought you, so you belong to him. He owns you. You are his property. You've been adopted into his family through the blood of Jesus. We belong to him and we belong with him. And since he bought you and since you belong to him, that means you have to become biddable. Biddable. When Paul called himself a slave of Christ, he implied that he did God's bidding. He wasn't just talking about being owned by God, but also we see throughout the New Testament, Paul did what the Holy Spirit bid him to do. Paul went where, where God told him to go. He said what God told him to say. Paul believed that he was to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. He believed that Christ lived his life through him. That's why he said in Galatians 2.20, I have become crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to ask yourself what God is bidding you to do. What does God lead you to do? What is God asking you to do? Because a master of a slave always keeps the slave busy. That's why he bought you, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And whether you are the youngest person here at Sweetwater Campus or sitting in Alumni Hall there in Parker, whether you're the oldest person in Havasu or in Parker, God is not done bossing you around. God still has plans for you. He has plans for you to be engaged, plans for you to serve. Your responsibility until your pulse stops is to do the bidding of Jesus because that is exactly what a slave does. A slave of Jesus never gets to retire. You can't get to a certain age, then all of a sudden say, I'm no longer a slave of Jesus. Now, because I punched my card serving in the nursery for 15 years, I no longer have to serve. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. Do what he wants you to do. And I don't know what it is, but do what God wants you to do and serve in a way that God is calling you to serve because slaves do their master's bidding. You have, been, you have been bought, you belong, so continue to be biddable. And that's what Paul implied when he called himself a slave. And then look how he addressed the Philippian followers in the second part of verse one. He said to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Now, it's a little bit uncomfortable to think about ourselves from God's perspective. It's hard for us to see ourselves the way God sees us. 
in most of our prayer time, I would guess, we describe ourselves back to God, we're most, we most likely lean towards our sinfulness. We say things like, oh God, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a miserable wretch. I'm a terrible sinner. I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I said that. Uh, Lord, forgive me. Or we say things like, we quote the apostle Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. Like, oh God, I'm just the worst of the worst. And thank you for your grace. Thank you for forgiving me. I'm undeserving of your grace and your forgiveness. And, and while those thoughts are accurate, right? Those thoughts are true. I also think that followers of Jesus need to remind ourselves how God sees us because God sees us through the lens of Jesus, through the sacrifice of Jesus. And it's because of the sacrifice of Jesus, I am no longer only a sinner, I am a saint and you are too. And a saint is holy, happy and helps spread the good news. A saint is holy, happy and helps spread the good news. Again, more alliteration, right? I guess you caught that, right? Holy, happy and helps. I grew up Catholic, okay? And I I went to a Catholic school And in every Catholic school that I went to, from kindergarten to fourth grade, I was in Catholic school, uh, I saw all kinds of images and pictures and portraits and paintings of saints on the wall at the school and in the church. And the saints uh, were always portrayed with these round glowing halos above their heads. They all had these halos. Their hands were almost always folded in prayer. They were always doing something benevolent to the peons beneath their feet. They were wearing crosses. And in my mind, oh, those were holy people. And they were people that I never wanted to be like. They were people that I could never measure up to. They were always so perfect, so incredible, so godly. Did you know that in the Catholic church, a person can only be called a saint after they've been through a long process called canonization. It happens long after that person dies. Uh, The Catholic church investigates their life with a fine tooth comb. They look for a couple of miracles that happened during their lifetime to see if they were, uh, they caused that miracle to occur. They read all of their writings to make sure that they're theologically and uh, sound and their doctrine is correct. Uh, They look at their actions and their attitudes and their interactions with other people. Their entire life is examined closely. And then... If they pass the test, they become a saint. But from God's perspective, there is only one step to become a saint. Just one. It's found in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved That is the one step that it takes from God's perspective to be considered a saint. Now, this might make you uncomfortable, but I'm going to spit some some truth to you, okay? A saint can be a drug addict who has surrendered her life to Jesus. You might think of them as an ex-junkie or an ex-addict, but God says that that person is a saint, A saint can be an alcoholic who has surrendered his life to Jesus, but still struggles with temptations. You might call him a drunk, but God says he is a saint. A saint can be a married couple who have each surrendered their lives to Jesus, but they struggle with bickering back and forth. And you might look at them and say that their marriage is crumbling and they're never going to make it, but God says they are saints. And if you have convinced yourself that you are worthless and add no value to this world, to our community, to this church here in Havasu or in Parker, God says that you've been chosen, you've been bought, and that you indeed are a masterpiece. If you feel like a zero on a scale from one to 10, God says that you are indeed a perfect 10 because the sacrifice that Jesus made for you on the cross has made you right with God. You have received his 
holiness. You have, yeah, you have been made pure. You've been made as holy as Jesus is and was. And since you have been made holy, you should live happy. You're made right in the sight of God. You should be happy because the creator of the universe loves you. Happy because God knows you. Happy because God lives inside of you. Happy because you've been chosen and adopted by God. Happy because you are free from condemnation, no matter how overwhelmingly guilty you feel at times or other people try to make you feel. You should feel happy because you have direct access to God anytime, day or night. You can call out to him and he will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Happy because you've been forgiven for all of your sin. Happy because you are a citizen of heaven. Happy because you are the dwelling place of the most high God. Happy because you've been born of God and the evil one cannot touch you or snatch you out of his hand. Happy because you will never be rejected, never be abandoned, never be forsaken, never be deserted, overlooked, or treated poorly by the God who gave his life for you. Yes. See, God's truth about your identity matters more than your negative thoughts about yourself. And because a follower of Jesus is holy and happy, they help spread the good news. They help tell other people about Jesus. Paul said in verse five, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Sharing the good news of Jesus is all of us working together in unity. Our mission at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And when you invite other people to church, you help lead people to Jesus. Excuse me, when you serve on the tech team, you help lead people to Jesus. When you help in the junior high ministry, you help lead people to Jesus. When you serve on the first impressions team, you help lead people to Jesus. When you're serving in our school, uh, schools, you're helping lead people to Jesus. And if you're interested in joining Calvary in this mission, let me encourage you, reach out and grab the serve card that's in front of you. Fill out your information on that serve card. Check the box of a place that you're interested in serving. And if you don't see a place that's on there for you, then write what God is putting in your heart, an area to serve in, and then drop it in one of the wooden, wooden offering boxes on the back wall as you leave. We want to help you get involved with the mission of Jesus. And we believe that people who have experienced the overwhelming love of God in their lives, people who have experienced his holiness, and his happiness that they want to help tell other people about the overwhelming love that God has for them. Uh, about a month ago, I was serving in our junior high ministry on Thursday night. And it's awesome. They, so many kids are in here and they're crazy and they're uh, spilling candy on the floor and they're not listening to the message. And, but God is speaking right? And they're, they're hearing and they're inviting their friends and it's such a cool thing to do. So I wasn't serving by preaching. I was actually sitting in the back of the room in a kind of in a hidden spot. And then the kids all went out to small groups and the room was covered and candy wrappers and chip wrappers, Coke was spilled all over the floor. There were Skittles and Tootsie Roll stuff and gum stuck on the floor in some spots. And I thought, man, this is awesome. I really did. So glad that those kids are here. So you know what I did? I grabbed a broom and a dustpan and I just started picking up stuff and sweeping up the trash and sweeping up the Skittles and sweeping up Skittles that were all over the place. And the Skittles were everywhere and swept up chips that were stepped on and crushed up and broken and Dorito powder on the floor 
And then after I swept up all the mess, I went and got the mop and filled it up, filled the mop bucket up. And I came back and there were about four Cokes that were spilled over the floor. And it wasn't like a few drops. It was like the whole cans. And I mopped them up. And then the kids were getting out of small groups. And a seventh grade boy came walking past me and he looked up at me and he said, are you the janitor? <laughs> and I said, what makes you think I'm the janitor? And he said, because you're mopping the floor. Aren't, aren't you the pastor? Why are you mopping? That's what a janitor does. And I told him, I'm a pastor, but I'm, I shouldn't be if I'm not willing to get in here and clean up after you guys. I shouldn't be a pastor if I'm not willing to get down and serve you guys as well. And I shouldn't be a pastor if I stand in the pulpit and tell people that they need to get involved in serving some way and I'm not willing to serve myself, right? See, I'm a slave to Jesus, but I'm also a saint. And I was so happy to be able to serve in a way that wasn't teaching, wasn't preaching, just being able to clean up after some kids because I was so glad that they were there that night and they brought their friends. I'm a slave, I'm a saint, and there's nothing else that I'd rather be. There is nothing else I would rather be. There's nothing else that I would rather do in my life when I walk through difficult days, difficult seasons, I know that I can get through any difficulty, any challenge that I face, anything that gets thrown at me or my family because I know who I belong to. See, when the world messes with me, I know that the world is messing with my daddy. I know who I belong to. I know that I do not have to face life alone because I've been bought by the blood of Jesus and I belong to him. Last Easter Sunday, Christy and I discovered that our third born, our third born daughter had type one diabetes. Preaching Easter messages, awesome weekend, go home and discover that. You know, we have four daughters and now three of them have been diagnosed with type one diabetes. I know that my family will make it through because I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? I'm not abandoned, I'm not alone, I'm not been rejected. And regardless of the difficulties that you face in your life, if you are indeed a follower of Jesus, you belong to somebody that watches over you, that cares for you and will carry you through any difficulty that you face whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, God will carry you through it. And if the outcome is not what we want, then he gives us the peace to get through there. He gives us the peace to walk through the season of heartache and pain. I know that God has my back. He is my strength. He is my fortress. He is indeed my refuge and he can be yours too if you surrender your life to Jesus and become a follower of Christ and receive forgiveness for your sins. And if you've not yet trusted in Jesus as your savior, our prayer team will be here at the close of the very last song. They would love to talk to you and explain to you what a life-changing relationship can be through Christ. And they'd love to lead you to surrender your life to Jesus. So saints, sinners, slaves, let's get busy and continue to be busy doing the bidding of God in Havasu and in Parker and making a difference in this world. Let's pray together. God, thank you that our identity is found in you. Thank you that while we are slaves, while we are saints, we get the joy of making a difference in people's lives. We get the joy of leading other people to a life-changing relationship with you. We get to experience the joy of telling other people the good news of Jesus. Thank you for that. Thank you that you counted us worthy to join in with this incredible work that you've been doing for thousands of years here on this earth. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to work, continue to transform us, continue to help us to become the men and women that you've called us to be. 
Father, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Again, our prayer team will be here at the close of this last song. If you have any need at all and you want prayer, they'll pray for you. But if you want to find out more about Jesus, you come talk to them as well. Let's stand together and let's worship.